So certainty abounds in what we can and cannot learn about our universe. But, as you can see, optimism abounds of what is possible. Of course, we don't know until we try, and so one way to go forth is to just keep going as hard as we can and assume that we're going to be able to learn everything we can imagine about the universe. Paul, are you optimistic about what we're going to be able to learn in the future? Well, I certainly agree with uh, Lawrence that we should never give up on this and pursue it for all we're worth. Um, will we get the ultimate answer through science? I have my doubts about that. Uh, I mean, there are a number of things that worry me. One is surprises. I mean, your discovery of dark energy was a surprise. Yes. Uh, but it's clearly fundamentally important and we couldn't possibly have a cosmological theory without it. But let's imagine dark energy being even 10 times weaker than we currently observe. There's no way we could measure it, or certainly if it was 100 or 1,000 times weaker, but it would still be important. Yep. What if there are important things that are just too small for us to measure in the era and the part of the universe that's accessible to us? So we're really talking about limits of knowledge. So, for example, imagine instead we were born oh, you know, a hundred billion years in the future, we would not be able to see the cosmic microwave background anymore. It would be faded beyond all oblivion. And indeed, all the galaxies we've talked about would more or less all be gone as well. So you really wouldn't be able to do the cosmology we do today. So that begs the question, is there a limit to knowledge at any given time when we can see with our own theories that it's going to disappear in the future? Yes, so if you imagine people were forward you know, 100 billion years or so from now when there are no other galaxies visible, even if they were infinitely intelligent, could they have figured out what we currently know about the universe? And it's not at all clear. It may well be the answer is no. Even no matter how clever they were, no matter what observation they made, with no matter what facilities, it's not at all clear they could learn anything because there's things that are missing. And presumably the same thing applies to us now. There may well be things that were really important when the universe was 10 to the minus 100 of a second, which have now gone beyond yeah. discovery. And nothing we can do, no matter how smart we are, we can have brains the size of planets, and it won't help us. Right. So let's just talk about then that beginning of the Big Bang. We have the whole notion of, you know, okay, so what, you know, what was the Big Bang? Was there anything before the Big Bang? You know, those questions, to my mind, are not clearly going to be answerable. I mean, I can't say they're not going to be answerable. So, but you're, you're with Lawrence. You think we should keep on trying on those we things? We should absolutely keep on trying. But actually, I get a real sense of deja vu on this whole stuff because, I mean, Lawrence was talking about when we go back to the beginning of the universe, you can always say what happened before that. But the whole idea of what happened before relies on time and causality. And clearly, time itself may have started at the Big Bang. And so what happened before the Big Bang, it's bad language. It's much like with quantum mechanics. We can ask questions in language, but our language is so tied up in common sense, they don't make sense there. But this actually reminds, this is nothing new. I mean, we're now debating this whole idea of causality. If A causes B causes C, what caused the first thing? Where did this whole chain start? Right. And the whole idea of time starting makes that really difficult. But this is something that philosophers have been debating for hundreds of years. It's nothing new to modern cosmology. Exactly the same problem occurs in classical theology. Okay, so let's imagine you say that why is the universe here? Well, God made it. But then what made God? Or why did God decide to make it? You've already pushed your thing back. You still have to explain something else. And the theologians had the whole ontological argument saying that maybe God is by definition the unmoved mover, the thing that doesn't need causation. So it's kind of interesting that we're now coming full circle and we're now talking about things that can cause themselves in very much the same way that theologians hundreds of years ago talked about God as something that can cause him or herself. So is that the same as saying that God has always existed or the universe has always existed or you're saying the causation is a little different than that? Well, that would resolve the causation issue if, if yeah. the universe is infinite, like an infinite inflation argument or God has always been there. But to my mind, that doesn't really solve the problem. We've still got the question of why is there something rather than nothing? Yes. Going right back to Descartes and probably much before that, why does anything exist? Um, in the religion, the whole issue is of why is God good? I mean, God can define himself to be good, but I could define myself to be good and no one would believe it. There has to be some outside standard of goodness. Um, and so likewise, even Lawrence's Wildest Dreams, you still need there to be laws of physics and they can be somewhat variable, but there has to be a law telling you how variable and that they vary. And where did that come from? 
I mean, that fundamental issue is a really interesting issue. It's not clear to me we've made any progress. We haven't gone backwards. We've maybe got a few clues, but we're, in some sense, I'd say no further ahead than we've been is for 2,000 years. Is this a job years. for science, then? Because, I mean, if we think about science at its core, science is about having a set of ideas, principles, which you test with observation. And what you're talking to me about here doesn't strike me as really fitting in to science when it comes down to the existence of the universe itself. Yeah, I mean, I guess my personal feeling would be this is, this is not a question science could address. But I'd like to be proven wrong on that. Science has addressed a lot of other questions that no one had thought it could ever have addressed. At the moment, I can't see how science can possibly address these things. So I think this is a, a job for the theologians and the priests and the rabbis and so on. I know Lawrence would disagree violently with that. Um, what do you think on this? Well, I think what we're going to end up doing is if it's science, we will do it as science. And people can, will be on this interface that's a little uncomfortable, I think, for me personally. But what I think we're going to end up doing is where we think we can make progress. I think scientists like myself, as we start trying to get the third nine on the equation of state parameter of dark energy, and you realize you're going to use an infinite amount of money to get the next nine, you start working on something else where it's easy to make progress. And so I think in the end, there's clearly lots of places to make progress in science. We haven't exhausted those. But it might be there are some dead ends, maybe permanently, but maybe temporarily. Who knows? I bet I would describe this as a place which I would say for me, at least as an observer, is definitely a dead end right now. So maybe I'd like to work on, you know, how did the first stars in the universe form, for example. Yeah, so when you're trying to pick a field to do research in, so let's say you're trying to sign up with a PhD supervisor, you, you've got a spectrum of problems. You've got the really interesting problems that you're not going to make any progress on. I think That's right. why does the universe exist is one of those. And then you've got the really boring problems that are very easy to make progress on, like exactly how many A5 stars are there in the constellation of Orion? I mean, yeah. we could answer that, but who cares? It's boring. And so the knack is trying to find that middle ground, something that is interesting enough that you'll want to devote your life to it, and that when you run a MOOC about it, people will actually tune in and watch it, but not so, not impossible. Yeah, so the art of being a scientist is not just answering questions, it's asking them. And that's what you're really getting down to, is asking the right questions. So on that note, we actually kind of conclude the, the section of the course that deals with cosmology. However, we're not going to finish everything here. We've got a special bonus for you. We've got an extra lesson we're going to put in where we're asking a lot of people about what the future of astrophysics across all the topics we've covered in all four courses is and where we're going to be going over the next hundred years. So stay tuned.